Hi, welcome to my channel. Today I want to share with you my analysis of Nike. I'm going to use this structure of analysis which I normally use. And the qualitative aspects of the company include competitive advantage, management, financial position, and past performance of the business. I'm going to follow this same order because past performance of the business is where I see how reliable and the past 10 years have been for the company in metrics like revenue growth and the margins, free cash flow generation. And of course, this is the basis I use for making projections. Um, so, so after the projections, I compute fair value and I error. So <laughs> I'm going to follow this structure. So we start with competitive advantages and the competitive advantages I see are intangible assets brand is the main one, then intangible assets innovation, technology and patents, scale of course, distribution network, digital and the direct to consumer infrastructure. And then I think they have some network effects. I'm going to explain it a little bit between athletes, pricing and, and um, research and development. Uh, they have no switching costs. So one important thing to mention is that all these competitive advantages, in, in essence, what they do is they build the brand, which is the main competitive advantage. Uh, so they, they sort of like support the brand in a, in a, in a virtuous loop, um, the way I see it. So let's uh, go and see why I think the brand is uh, so, so powerful. Nike has sponsorship with athletes in all major sports like Cristiano Ronaldo, LeBron James, Rafael Nadal and Serena Williams, or of course Michael Jordan. The partnership of 40 years, they have their own brand, Jordans, which has sold 5 billion in revenue in the fiscal 2022. The other intangible assets they have is innovation and patents and um, technology. And um, John Danahoe said in the last conference call that they had six different rooms in the Serena Williams building full of the innovation pipeline for the next three years. That is supported by scale, I think, because if you can ship to 190 countries, 1,000 stores, 6,000 stores op uh, operated by franchises, annual revenue about double the second largest uh, company in your market, and then a market share that looks sustainable, that provides you, especially this one, annual revenue, uh, an edge in research and development and marketing, because you have a large budget. And this pro produces a virtuous loop, in my view, which is between innovation, athletes, brand, and pricing power. So the innovation attracts athletes which improve the brand and in allow it for a, for a pricing power which allows for innovation through this larger research and development but it also works the other way so athletes give feedback to the, the r d department and of course improve the product by improving the product you get pricing power Pricing power, we know sometimes uh, makes a brand more desirable and uh, that more desirable brand also attracts athletes. So the loops works uh, between these four um, aspects work, work both ways. So this is what I was mentioning when I said network effect because they feed into each other in, in both ways and uh, it all builds, as, as you see here, the brand. Let's uh, now dis discuss returns on capital because I think that they are related with competitive advantages. It's a, a byproduct, let's say, of a company with a competitive advantages. So if, if you see the returns on capital of a company and uh, they are very high or higher than weighted, cost, weighted average cost of capital, like in this case, they averaged 27% over the last decade based on this calculation which is earnings before interest and taxes divided by the sources of, of capital. When you see that, that, that means that the company has some type of competitive advantage because competition will be attracted to a business which has higher returns than weighted average cost of capital. 
And of course, when there's more, more competition, the returns are going to go down towards weighted average cost of capital. So if you see the, the margin that between return and the cost, um, which is sustainable, then that means that there is some sort of competitive advantage. And in this case, if you see the lowest was 14%, which is in, for the last 10 years, which is even still still higher than the cost of capital, which in my, as per my calculations is around 9%. So that means a company that is creating value. And this is the most important thing I see in a company, whether it's business, will be able to create value in the long term. If you see my valuations in the past, and these are in, in, in blue, uh, in, this is in the last 10 years, you see that as per my calculations, Nike is a company that is valuable, more valuable uh, as time goes by. And, the, and if you see the price, the price follows somehow the, this value creation but it's of course much more volatile and that gives us the opportunities like in these cases or, or here for example or here today to buy this uh, company at a lower price than what the calculation is of value at the time. Um, a company that creates value um, you can even buy that even a little slightly over overvalued or fairly valued and you will still make a good investment. Of course, if you can buy it at a discount, it's even better. So management, I'm going to highlight here for the CEO, John Donahoe, the CFO, Matthew Friend, the um, executive chairman and the ex-CEO, Mark Parker, and uh, Travis Knight, which is the son of uh, Phil Knight, the founder, which together uh, with all the holding companies and trusts uh, they control, they have 16% of the, of the company. This is something I like, uh, large portions of their money, let's say, invested in the company. Donahoe with experience in technology, um, it's a great value for Nike because um, the next uh, few years, uh, or probably the next decade, the growth is going to come mainly not only the growth in sales but also the growth in uh, gross in margins and in, in the operating margins is going to come from the move from uh, wholesale selling to direct to consumer or and digital. So I think that this uh, is a great uh, it's a great value to, um, to Nike. In terms of the financial position. Nike has only in the in one of the past 10 years it has uh, had positive debt and uh, in the other nine and including now it has had um, negative debt or more cash than debt so so the financial position is pristine let's now check annual revenue for the last seven years this is the mix by segments um, the largest is North America, but you see China is quite substantial and uh, also Europe and Middle East. This is the compounded annual growth rate for the seven past, past seven years. China the, the fastest, but look at Europe and Middle East is also quite, quite, uh, quite healthy. But in the last year, China has been hit quite hard. If we check here the quarterly revenue, we can see the impact uh, on the last, especially on the last quarter, 19.24% on a year-on-year -year basis in Greater China. And this is virus-related disruptions in China and also the continuing supply chain constraints that the world is, is suffering. And it's affecting the business in China more than in other places. In fact, Asia and Latin America have been growing quite quite fast. This situation is, in my view, temporary. And uh, remember, when we project, we, we want to see 10 years ahead. I think this is going to be corrected. And I essentially agree with uh, the CEO in the last conference call. He said that they are better positioned to drive sustainable long-term growth than they were before the pandemic. And this is 
I think uh, because they have a much better structure for uh, digital than, than, than they had uh, before the pandemic, uh, it's a business that's uh, growing faster with better margins. And uh, the, I think this Nike is, is really well prepared for, to take advantage of that. If you see here from the conference call as well, digital, the advantage that we're mentioning, grew 18% in fiscal 2022. So it, it grew faster than any other uh, segment, let's say. Um, even though this, this is not a segment per se, they, they, don't, um, they don't show it as a segment. It reached 24% of the business in the fourth quarter. And by my calculation, this is approximately 10 to $11 billion uh, sold in, in digital which is quite, quite large and much larger than a couple of years ago. In terms of the operating income in a quarterly basis, you see here how greater China has been hit really hard and also North America. The CFO in the call mentions the gross margin declined 80 basis points on the, on the quarter and uh, due to the specific actions taken to manage supply and demand in greater China, and this is following the COVID-related disruptions and also elevated freight and logistic costs. These headwinds were partially offset by better margins in Nike Direct and a higher full price mix. The sales in general and administrative also grew due to some investments, also inflation, and inventories grew 23% compared to the pre previous year, and this is due to supply chain issues. So if we, if we go to the outlook for fiscal 2023, they are confident about the brand strength and consumer connection, the product pipeline, and think that they are normalizing the inventory supply into a healthy pool market in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. Revenue. They expect low double digits, let's say, let's say 12%, but foreign exchange is going to be a headwind of uh, roughly 400 basis points, which means roughly 8% in the two of them. And this is long-term expectations. They mentioned uh, are high side single digits or to low double digits. So between eight and 12%. So fiscal year 2023 is going to be on the lower side of the long-term expectations that they have for the business. So the situation of margins is not great currently, but they have expanding margins in Nike Direct and Nike Digital and higher full price selling. Uh, that would have expanded margins 100 basis points in the fourth quarter. So um, of course, the problems that they have in China were a headwind of 200 basis points and that's mainly why the, the margins were negative uh, but one thing that is uh, he's mentioning the CFO is that they still believe in the high 40s cross margin goal for the long term so this is something I, I, I'm going to keep in mind when pro projecting so let's now go to the projections this is the income statement the historical 10 years and the projections, the way I, I, I look at it. Um, if you see total revenue has been increasing at a 7% compounded annual growth rate, and I'm going to assume roughly 8%, and this is on the lower range of management's goal, which is 8 to 12, to 12%. Then gross profit margin is being between 44 and 46. And remember, they have a high 40s goal, but I'm going to assume 45% in gross, gross margin. Operating margin, also they have on the high teens, and I'm going to assume 12% to 14%. So that, I think, are conservative projections for the company. Um, it, pro it gives me an EBITDA for 2032, May 2032, of almost 16 billion. So this is the one to keep in mind for valuation purposes. We go to the free cash flow now, and again, historical and projections. You see historical 8.8% compounded annual growth rate. I'm going to assume the same. I'm going to use capital expenditures to revenues 
the average of the past 10 years, which is 2.7%. Deducting that from the operating cash flow gives me the free cash flow. And I am assuming 12.5 billion in, in 2032. So this 12.5 billion plus the 15, 16 billion of a BDA as of May, with these ratios I am assuming, I compute the enterprise value. They don't have debt uh, or very slight uh, levels of uh, net debt, negative net debt. That gives me mark market capitalization divided by the weighted average stocks uh, outstanding. That's my target price for a BDA uh, for, for free cash flow. That gives me 235, the average price for 2032 as per this calculation. So this 24 and this 30, the way I compute this in a BDA is if you see enterprise value to a BDA for the past 10 years, uh, it's, been, it's been growing as you see. So this line that I have here is sort of like represents, represents the trend. And um, I am assuming 24 which is roughly around here, and it's a, a bit higher than what the, the company is experiencing today. And in the free cash flow, enterprise value to free cash flow, you can see this line here, 25, 30, sorry, 30, is roughly the mean, even though they say here 36. Um, but I'm going to use this line uh 30 so that's what i'm using 24 and 30. so that's how i calculate this the price um the investors cash flow would be if they buy at today's price and they sell at the target price with all this free cash flow per share that the company produces uh, the, during these 10 years it gives you this ira so if you buy at 105, the IRR for the company is 12%. So if you are happy to go to 10% uh, in your investment, you would be able to pay 124, and this would be the fair value of the company. And uh, so that's, um, that's all. That's um, my analysis of uh, Nike. As you see, it's a company with a great brand. And uh, I see competitive advantages lasting for the next decade and probably two more decades or more. So it's a long-term investment that if you buy at a fair price or even at a good price like today, at a discounted price, you can get 10 to 12% returns if you hold it for a very long period of time, 20 to 10, 20 years. So... Um, one of the things I see is the risk uh, in, uh, in growth uh, in China. You, you never know what, uh, it's a little bit of uncertain, and um, what could happen in China with brands that are, um, let's say, not uh, Chinese brands. And that because of all the political pressure, probably, there could be, you know, some unintended consequences for companies that the business in China. This is the only sort of like uh, risk I see in, 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 in Nike. But of course, investing in a company with, uh, you always have to, to have, you, you always will have some risks and um, the power of the brand really, and the projections are not too aggressive. Um, it gives you a decent discount to fair value so I think it's a good proposition of um, between risk and reward that I see with, uh, with Nike. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and also make some comments. And if you like the video, please give it a like. If you, if you can make me any comments, whether you want something different or uh, whether you have different ideas about the, um, the evaluations I make or even the companies I, I choose, that would be great. Uh, so thanks very much. See you next time. Bye-bye.